Hi, my name is Nadine Ibrahim and I'm the Terpstra Chair in Urban Engineering at the University of Waterloo in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And the title of my lecture is Greenhouse Gas Emissions in Global Cities, which describes the ways in which greenhouse gas emissions are accounted for and these numbers tell a story behind the activities in cities. Cities contribute to much of the greenhouse gas emissions globally and therefore contribute to climate change because they are the economic drivers in the countries in which they are located. So I wanted to put cities in global context first before diving into the specifics of greenhouse gas emissions. Population. So far, population growth has been the driver of urban growth. And according to the United Nations, cities are home to over 50% of the world's population, and that's expected to increase to 70% by the year 2050. With urban growth comes energy use. And where there is light, there is energy based on fossil, fuel can, fossil fuels for the most part, according to the International Energy Agency. A near doubling of the energy demand has been observed since the 1980s, and that's expected to increase another 85% by the year 2050. With energy use comes climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And ICLE, the Local Governments for Sustainability, estimate that cities account for 70% of the global emissions, and that's projected to increase to 76% by the year 2030 if we continue to live at current urbanization trends and economic growth. So we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and we're talking about units of CO2. So I first wanted to give a sense of scale and give a sense of size for the units that we're going to be talking about. This is a cube. It was an arts installation in the 2009 Copenhagen United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it was constructed using shipping containers with two sides draped with uh, screens to showcase videos and images. And this measures 27 feet on all sides, so that's approximately 8 meters on all sides, and that's the size of a cube that represents one ton of CO2. So I wanted to take a step back and ask first, why is it important for a city to have a greenhouse gas emissions inventory? Well, countries do the same, and countries report their greenhouse gas emissions inventories annually uh, using an IPCC methodology, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they report it to the UN FCCC. Cities have a similar motivation because they also have emission targets to achieve, and knowing that number allows them to reduce some of the energy-consuming activities and greening some of those options. So... There are some basic principles around greenhouse gas inventories and how they are put together and how they are report, calculated and reported. So let's take them one by one. First, greenhouse gases. There's a number of gases, but predominantly six. CO2 is carbon dioxide, CH4, methane, N2O, nitrous oxide, SF6, sulfur hexafluoride, HFCs, hexafluorocarbons, and PFCs, perfluorocarbons. And they are added together and normalized in CO2 equivalents, depending on the kind of gases that are included in the inventory. Second is geographic boundary. Now, city boundaries are tricky. Country boundaries, however, they're a little bit easier to determine because there are country borders, which are known to all of us. City boundaries, for the purpose of inventories, is the jurisdictional boundary where a municipality owns and operates and delivers municipal services. So that is the boundary of interest when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions accounting for urban regions. Third is emissions attribution, and this is a matter of perspective. It could be a production-based perspective, looking at the source or where the energy is generated, or it could be a consumption-based perspective, looking at the end use where the energy is consumed. Fourth is the calculation. Now, the calculation is relatively simple. Greenhouse gas emissions is a multiplication of two factors, activity level and emission factor, though there's a lot of sophistication and complexity that goes into coming up with those numbers. Activity level is the number that measures how much energy is consumed. It could be gigawatt hours of electricity. It could be kilometers traveled for transportation. Emission factors is a measure of the carbon intensity of the fuels. So it could be grams of CO2 per liter of uh, fuel when it comes to transportation, greenhouse uh, gas emission and cleanliness of the electricity mix is measured in grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So it's um, CO2, that emission factor per unit of fuel. Fifth is emissions classification. And this is a way to place uh, sources of emissions in uh, groups referred to as scopes. 
So this diagram here is by the World Resources Institute, and you can see scope one is direct emissions within the urban boundary, primarily fuel combustion uh, in stationary or mobile, trans uh, mobile transportation. Scope two are emissions that occur outside of city boundaries, so indirect emissions that are a result of activities within the city. And then scope three are indirect emissions beyond city boundaries. Uh, they include things like um, marine, air navigation, and sometimes it's the life cycle and upstream and embodied emissions of the products and services that are uh, brought in from outside the city for consumption in urban activities. Another way of looking at it is this diagram here by Bilan Carbon, which puts scopes one, two, and three in concentric circles. So the yellow inner circle is scope one within the urban boundary. Scope two is the orange circle, primarily for electricity and, and heating and cooling. And then scope three is the outer red circle, and that's the upstream life cycle and embodied emissions. Sixth is data precision. And that pertains to the quality of the data that is used in the calculation. And this ranges from tier one, two, or three. When it comes to activity data, tier one is uh, general data, could be national averages scaled down to the city. Tier two could be more specific engineering estimates. And tier three could be actually metered uh, data uh, that gives us an idea of exactly how much of a particular energy is consumed for activities. When it comes to emission factors, uh, these tiers are also applicable. So tier one uh, for an emission factor would be sort of an international average that any country could use. Tier two would be more locally specific numbers for these emission factors. And then tier three could be very specific down to the combustion technology or the strategy for waste uh, processing, for example. Seventh is reporting format, and um, this could be corporate emissions, reporting only what the city owns and operates, or it could be community emissions, which is all residents in an urban area. So by default, corporate emissions are a subset of community emissions. Now that we've gone through some of the basics that uh, form these inventories, here's a sample of inventories, and there's many more. But just to give you an idea, there's the Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory. There's a local government greenhouse gas emissions, emissions um, analysis protocol by ICLE. There's the EC Covenant of Mayors, and there's the World Bank, UNEP, uh, and UN Habitat International Standard. There's the World Resources Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the GHG Protocol. There's an ISO standard. There's the Greenhouse Gas Regional Inventory Protocol, GRIP. There's the French Bilan Carbon, there's the Eco2 Region, CO2 Calculator, Project 2 Degrees, and the list goes on. So knowing all of these inventories and knowing the differences and the nuances between them, my colleagues and I um, decided to compare some of the inventories to see what impact it has on the numbers that are reported by the cities. So we took six of these inventories to compare. And where you see uh, the shaded boxes, that's where it is not included. And where you see the white boxes, that's where it is included. So you'll see out of the six that we compared, in this particular case for community emissions, two were not applicable. And that's the um, WRI and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development Inventory and the ISO standard. They were not applicable to community emissions, so we're left with the other four. And you'll see that it's also broken down into scopes one, two, and three. We also looked at corporate emissions. Again, looking at the same six, there were two that were not applicable to corporate emissions, and those were the World Bank, UNEP, UN Habitat, and GRIP. They were not applicable to corporate emissions. And again, the shaded boxes in gray are where they are excluded, and the white boxes where they are included. So we'll take a look at these inventories and how they are applicable to a number of cities. And throughout the findings that will be demonstrated, uh, you'll realize that the numbers that are reported for urban characteristics and activities is really a balance between two things, the geophysical factors in cities and the technical factors. Geophysical factors is what the city is endowed with. Is it a warm climate? Is it cold climate? Uh, what are their resources? Does it have access to solar energy or hydropower? Or the, its gateway status? Is it a port city or is it a landlocked city? Technical factors are some of the more engineered decisions like uh, what technology is used for energy generation, or what is the energy mix, uh, what technology is used for waste processing, etc. And it's, it's a fine balance between these two. 
So let's start off New York City. It's the most populous city uh, in the US and it's the uh, urbanized area of the New York metropolitan area. And it has a population of 8.4 um, million and on a land area of 1,214 square kilometers. Uh, New Yorkers typically commute to work, so there's a lot of use of mass transit, and they also do a lot of walking, very low automobile ownership, and um, on a per capita basis, uh, less than the comparable American city, or a third less than the average American city. So just broad strokes in a profile of New York City, when we're looking at the inventories, this is community emissions, comparing the four inventories that were applicable to community emissions that we were comparing, in addition to the very first bar, which is New York's actually reported um, inventory. And you'll realize that the difference could be as low as 49 megatons or as high as 66, depending on which inventory could be applicable. So we're just plugging in those numbers to see how they fare. You'll realize scope one, two, and three is blue, red, and green. There's very little differences in scopes one and two. Three is where it varies, which is that outer circle, that indirect um, emissions. When we look at corporate emissions for New York City, it's what the municipality owns and operates. Again, looking at the four inventories plus the one that New York City actually reported. Again, there's a wide range. In this case, there's also a variability in scopes two and three. Scope one is fairly consistent because this is within the jurisdictional boundaries. Okay, let's take a look at another city, Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai is located in China on the eastern coast, in the middle portion of that eastern coast. It's the most populous city in China with a population of 18.2 million and on a land area of 6,200 square kilometers. It used to be a fishing and a textiles town, and now it's the showpiece of the uh, Chinese economy. It's got a heavy ind manufacturing industry, a very limited agricultural industry, and it is also known to be the world's busiest container port. So again, broad profile of Shanghai. Let's see how the inventory uh, lines up. So the inventory ranges anywhere between 193 megatons to 235 megatons. Again, depending on which uh, of the four inventories that could be applicable. Uh, scope one varies a little. Scope two is fairly consistent. And scope three, which is the wider indirect emissions, uh, uh, they are accounted for in two out of the four inventories. Hence, this is what makes that significant range. And one more city, Paris. So uh, Paris has a population of 2.1. It's a very densely populated city located within the larger Ile-de-France region, which is over 11 million. And again, the most populous uh, region in France. It's known for uh, being a a very popular tourist destination, receiving anywhere between 30 and 45 million tourists. And uh, there's very low construction activity. Most of the buildings are built pre-1970s, and uh, that dates uh, before the first thermal regulation of 1974. So there's very little insulation in the buildings. And again, just given that profile for Paris, the way the inventories um, line up, uh, we've applied two inventories here, GRIP, gives a total of about 10.8 megatons of CO2. And you'll notice uh, mobile combustion and stationary combustion, the blue and the orange, is the uh, majority of the emissions reported. If you look at the Bilan Carbon uh, inventory approach, that gives a total of about 38 megatons. And again, differences in how the, uh, the orange and the blue, the mobile and the stationary combustion is calculated. So that's a fourfold difference between the two inventories. Um, so uh, depending on the choice of inventory, the difference could, differ, differences could vary significantly. So now that we've seen a sample of three cities and how different inventories would result in different numbers reported on a per capita basis, New York could range between 5.8 and 7.9 tons of CO2. For Shanghai, that's between 10.7 and 12.8 uh, tons of CO2. Paris is where there's a fourfold difference depending on the inventory, and that could range anywhere between 5.1 and 20.1 tons of CO2. So having gone through uh, the differences in the methodologies, its implications when applied to cities, there is a motivation to harmonize this approach, which would overcome some of these methodological challenges and differences among the inventories. In 2010, there was the international standard by the World Bank, UNEP, and UN Habitat, 
And in 2014, there became the Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions by the World Resources Institute, C40, and ICLE, which is now the standard that is used in cities. And it was motivated by seeing the results of this comparison of inventories to motivate a unified approach so that numbers could be comparable, cities could be comparable, and cities could learn from one another. Mm -hmm.